All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, as you will have seen, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has entered into force today. This is the first multilateral nuclear disarmament treaty in more than 20 years. In a video message issued early this morning, the Secretary General said that the TPNW is an important step towards the goal of world free of nuclear weapons and a strong determination of support for multilateral approaches to nuclear disarmament. He commends the states that have ratified it and welcomes the instrumental role of civil society in advancing the treaty's negotiations and entry into force. The survivors of nuclear explosions and nuclear tests offered tragic testimonies and were a moral force behind the treaty, he said. Entry into force is a tribute of their enduring advocacy. The Secretary General looks forward to carrying out the functions assigned by the treaty, including the preparations of the first meeting of states' parties. Uh, nuclear, uh, just to add that nuclear weapons pose a growing danger and the world needs urgent action to ensure their elimination and to prevent the catastrophic human and environmental consequences they would cause. The Secretary General calls on all states to work together to realize the ambition to advance common security and collective safety. Also, uh, on nuclear disarmament, uh, I just wanted to uh, make some comments relating the latest developments surrounding the new START treaty. Uh, the Secretary General welcomes the decision by the United States to seek a five-year extension of the New START Treaty, as well as the Russian Federation's reiteration that it also seeks a five-year extension. A five-year extension would not only maintain verifiable caps on the world's two largest nuclear arsenals, but will also provide time to negotiate new nuclear arms control agreements to grapple with our increasingly complex international environment. The Secretary General encourages both states to work quickly to complete the necessary procedure for the new start's extension before the 5th of February expiration and move as soon as possible to negotiations on a new arm control measures. Um, and turning to southern, uh, to Mozambique and southern Africa, our humanitarian colleagues tell us they're supporting the governments in the, across the region to prepare for and respond to the approaching tropical cyclone LOEs. According to the World Meteorological Organization, the cyclone is expected to make landfall near Beira in central Mozambique early tomorrow local time. As you will recall, that was the same area that was hit by Cyclone Idai less than two years ago, and the Secretary General had visited uh, Beira in July of 2019. And we are obviously concerned about the prospects of significant flooding, particularly in Mozambique, where rivers have already at alert levels and flooding has been reported in several locations ahead of Eloise's landfall. The government of Mozambique is carrying out evacuations, and we and our partners have deployed personnel and supplies in advance to be ready to respond quickly. After landfall in Mozambique, the cyclone is expected to weaken but could bring heavy rains to neighboring countries, including Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Botswana. Humanitarian organizations in the region are already overstretched by ongoing operations, especially in Mozambique and Zimbabwe, and it is expected that more funding will be urgently needed. And an update on Tigray, where while we have been able to send some supplies in, mainly uh, to refugee camps, the assistance to date is insufficient in the face of rapidly rising needs generated by the conflict. Constrained humanitarian access continues to limit much needed aid regarding, read, excuse me, constrained humanitarian access continues to limit much needed aid uh, to get to people in Tigray. Nearly three months since the conflict began, this includes basic medical supplies. We urgently need blanket clearances to send more staff and supplies to Tigray so that we can ramp up the response and ensure it's commensurate with the needs. And uh, the Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, ended his visit to Mali, where he took stock of the recent political and security developments and discussed progress made to implement the mandate of UN peacekeeping mission in the country and the political transition currently underway in Mali. Uh, in Bamako, alongside the head of mission, Mr. Anadif, uh, Mr. Lacroix met with a number of Malian senior officials, including the president, the vice president, of the prime minister, and the foreign minister, and the president of the National Transitional Council, 
all this with the aim of strengthening partnership between the UN and the transitional authorities during this crucial period. He also visited the new headquarters of the G5 Sahel Joint Force in Bamako, which was built uh, with financial support from the UN mission and the European Union. Mr. Lacroix also took part in a ceremony to honor the memories of peacekeepers killed in last week's uh, attack. He then also traveled to Timbuktu and Yafunke, where he was briefed uh, by peacekeepers on the operations uh, there. And Mr. Lacroix also went to Menaka before coming back to Bamako, where he met with the president of the Regional Youth and Civil Society, uh, Youth Council and Civil Society members. Uh, Mr. Lacroix welcomed efforts that are key to peace and security in Mali. And in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the humanitarian coordinator there, David McClan Carr, is condemning recent massacres and abductions and other human rights violations committed against civilians by armed combatants in North Kivu's Beni territory. In a statement, he said the situation is alarming and unacceptable. More than 150 people, most of them women and children, have died because of violent attacks between the 11th of December and January 10th. At least 100 people were kidnapped and injured over the same period. Looting of health facilities, natural resources, burning down of homes have also been reported. Since November of, 20, of 2019, violence in Beni territories increased and spread to Irumu and Mombasa territories in the neighboring Ituri province. And as of last week, more than 67,000 people have been displayed as a result of the violence. Humanitarian assistance is being provided, uh, but the needs are immense and more funding is needed to scale up the response. And sadly, a new grim milestone has been reached in the Sahel, which includes Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, and Niger. More than two million people have now been forced to flee violence and are displaced within the borders of their country. Needs are surging across the region where multiple crises are converging. UNHCR said today the communities hosting the displaced have reached a breaking point. The humanitarian response is dangerously overstretched. UNHCR is urging the international community to redouble its support in the region. Uh, and just to note that in Darfur, uh, the UN Refugee Agency and the UN Human Rights Office today expressed their concern over recent deadly intercommunal clashes in the region. Um, over the 200 people that died, three of them were humanitarian workers. Uh, the UN Human Rights Office fears that the lack of security and chronic impunity in the region leaves vulnerable to serious uh, violence. And UNHCR says the recent violence has forced more than 100,000 people to flee their homes, including across the border into Chad. UNHCR is, of course, mobilizing resources. Uh, some 3,500 Sudanese have arrived in Wadai province in eastern Chad, and they are living in four very remote locations with a basic lack of basic services or public infrastructure. UNHCR is rushing supplies to respond to their needs. Uh, before these latest round of clashes, Chad was already hosting more than 360,000 Sudanese refugees. And you saw that yesterday afternoon we condemned, strongly condemned, the deadly double suicide bombing targeting civilians at the market in Baghdad. And the Secretary General appealed to the people of Iraq to reject any attempt to spread fear and violence aimed at undermining peace, stability, and unity. And the UN support mission in Libya announced the start of a one-week period of the submission of candidacies for the position of a three-member presidency council and of prime minister. That period ends January, January 28th. The mission also developed and released technical guidance and related forms for the submission of candidacies in accordance with the eligibility criteria adopted by the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum in mid-November. Following the end of the nomination period, the UN mission will convene the Political Dialogue Forum in Switzerland for the voting process from the 1st to the 5th of February. Um, and on Monday, 11 o'clock, there'll be a virtual press briefing here by Elliot Harris, the Chief Economist and Assistant Secretary General for the Economic Development. He will brief you on the launch of the latest World Economic Situation and Prospects report. Uh, I think you were briefed on that uh, this morning. Uh, also, just a flag on Monday, the Secretary General's three major remarks, uh, one to um, the Davos Forum. 
the second uh, to the climate uh, meeting hosted by the Netherlands. And uh, in the evening, he will partake in the annual Holocaust uh, Remembrance Ceremony in uh, the Park Avenue East Synagogue. We will share all those remarks with you under embargo a bit later today. And I want to end on a good note. Four more member states have joined the honor roll, taking up to a healthy 16. They are Bulgaria, Ireland, Nauru, and Singapore. We thank them very, very much. Um, I will take some questions. Yes, Edie. Um, hi, Steph. The Security Council held an area formula meeting today on press freedom in Belarus and uh, almost but not all uh, speakers were highly critical of the lack of freedom of the press in Belarus. Does the Secretary General have an opinion on the state of freedom of the press in Belarus? Look, we have, I think the Secretary General has repeatedly expressed his uh, concern at lack of freedom of the press uh, in many parts around the world. And uh, if you will recall, during the, um, uh, the demonstrations that took place uh, in Belarus, we had expressed our concern at the arrests of uh, journalists, Belarusian journalists, foreign journalists, uh, hampering their inability uh, to report on events. Yes, Lenka. Uh, thank you, Stefan. I have a question on what is the number of people coming these days into the UN, and uh, are you planning to ask of those vaccinated to come back? Thank you. Sorry, are we going to ask the people who are vaccinated yeah. to come back? No, listen, uh, I think it's important to note that uh, vaccines are critically important, uh, but there are also other measures still need to take in, in, in it's not a need, need to be in place. So we will be guided uh, in terms of reopening the building more, guided by uh, the city of uh, of New York uh, and how uh, they, uh, they help, you know, how, we don't want to get ahead of the city. We don't want to get ahead of the state. Uh, the Secretary General has been extremely cautious from the start. He will continue to approach us uh, with caution. And, you know, in terms of UN staff, um, uh, obviously those who have, I mean, in New York right now, if I'm not mistaken, it is people over 65. Uh, so there aren't that many UN staff over 65. The Secretary General is one of them. Uh, there are others, but I won't, uh, I won't name them. Um, uh, and obviously people with pre-existing conditions. So it's, it's not that many uh, people. But to give you a shorter answer, the reopening of the building will be guided by public health policies decided upon by the Secretary General upon advice and obviously by the city and the state of New York. Yeah, go ahead. And what is the footprint? Right now, we're at about, uh, I mean, I'm looking at the swipes every day, about six to 700 every day, people coming in. Yes, Carla. Thank you. Um, can you explain what is the relationship between um, the Committee on the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and the Security Council? Because I know reference is constantly being made to the NPT at the Security Council. Is there any actual connection between the two? Uh, I think you'd have to look at the, the language of the treaty. Um, obviously, the, the bodies, uh, they, there are different bodies in the UN uh, dealing with disarmament, the Conference of Disarmament, other committees uh, of the General Assembly. But you'd have to, that's a question you need to answer yourself by looking at the treaty. Okay, uh, any other, qu uh, Iftikhar? Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, in view of the uh, eruption of deadly violence in, uh, in Darfur, is there any thinking going on to somehow reactivate the UN uh, 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 African Union uh, hybrid force uh, there, because the uh, b because of the uh, to control the violence, the division is now uh, in the process of being withdrawn from Darfur. The the withdrawal of the joint UN AU mission was a decision taken 
uh, by the Security Council. Uh, I mean, if Takar, you, you and I have been here qu quite some time. We know that that peacekeeping missions uh, do not uh, cannot be materialized or rematerialized uh, overnight. Um, there is no discussion of that that I'm aware of in any way. Um, we're obviously very, you know, we now, the UN is represented through a political mission, UNITOMS, which is there to support uh, the people and the government of, uh, of Sudan during this period of, of transition. You know, we've obviously taken note of the efforts by the government uh, to try to uh, respond to the violence. Um, as far as we can tell, the, res the, the situation in both... Um, in, uh, in West Darfur and in South Darfur is calm but remains tense. Uh, we are also in contact with the government. The Secretary General spoke uh, yesterday with Prime Minister Hamdok to discuss the situation and expressed his um, concern at the escalation of the intercommunal violence. I think it's very important that the transitional authorities continue every effort to de-escalate the situation. It's also very important to hold perpetrators accountable uh, and ensure the protection of civilians uh, in accordance with the government's <coughs> national plan for civilian protection and also to strengthen its efforts to address the root causes of these persistent intercommunal and resource-based conflicts. Uh, Ms. Salome. Thank you, Stefan. Um, do you know anything about, uh, apparently, uh, there's been a petition submitted for Tanzania to be uh, recognized as an independent state to a UN sub-office. Do you know anything about that and what the process is and where that might Tanzania? Uh, is that, sorry, what did you say? You might receive this petition. No, sorry, I, what did you say, for Tanzania? Yes, uh, Tanzania. Uh, apparently, there's a petition with uh, that's been lodged about the legality of the union between mainland Zanzibar and Tanzania, and a uh, petition was filed at a UN sub office today, calling uh, for okay. self determination and sovereignty. The short answer is, uh, in the pre prelude to your question, is do you know anything? And the short answer is no. Uh, so I have not heard of this at all but I'm happy to try to find out. Yeah, if we could, we would like to confirm that that has been received. Okay, all right. Okay, if you could yeah. send me something on that, that would be useful. Okay. Okay. We have uh, any other questions? Yes, Ibtisam. Um, hi, Steph. Um, is there any update regarding the issue of um, uh, Houthis and designating them as a terrorist organization? Do you see any move from the new administration to lift that? Have you been in contact with them? Uh, no, there's been no nothing that I'm able to that I'm aware of. Um, obviously, it's early days. I think the the. The U.S. administration knows firmly where where the U.N. stands. I will also take note that in his um, confirmation hearing, the Secretary of State designate uh, said they would take a hard look at the designation and also, I think, uh, acknowledge the humanitarian impact uh, that that decision has had or can, will have. Okay. Uh, thank you all. I think.